One of the highlights of uh, this year's Melbourne Documentary Film Festival is a film called Hostile. And it is my great pleasure to be speaking to the director of Hostile, Sunita Gale. Uh, Sunita, welcome to Movie Metropolis. Oh, thank you for having me. It's so nice to be here. Good to talk to you all the way from the UK. <laughs> yes, indeed. All the way from London. Yeah. London. OK, excellent. Now, uh, this is uh, such an intriguing documentary about the uh, pretty much the hatred that a number of refugees and immigrants have been facing in England, um, part, mainly because of their skin colour or because of their religion, being Muslim or whatever. Uh, it, it's an incredible portrait of a country that's sort of turning within itself uh, in a very unhappy sort of way. What was the origin of the documentary? Yeah, I mean, I guess you're right in what you're saying about what's happening within our country right now. We're really in some dark times. And I think when the pandemic struck, um, I started to think deeply about my own heritage. I mean, my parents were survivors of the partition of India and Pakistan, and they moved to the UK in the 50s, like many migrants did back then, post Second World War, War post empire. And when the pandemic struck, we became reliant on our communities and our communities became everything. And for me, my local community became everything to me. And my parents resided in a community in the West Midlands in a place called Bilston. Um, they were factory workers, they were key workers, and they also ran a convenience store. So when the pandemic struck, I really started deep, to deeply connect with my childhood and really the contribution my own parents made to this society and my own family and my aunties, my uncles, my grandparents that came here in the 30s. And so that deep reflection gave me the impetus really to go out and start filming. And, and actually, if I think back, I was actually looking for my mom and dad in a way and my community that I was so connected to as a child. I was trying to seek them out and try to find out what they were doing, you know, 50 years on. And as I was filming this narrative and unfolding this story about the very key workers, the crucial workers that were keeping our society moving, the migrants, the people that came here as asylum seekers, as refugees, the working class, those people, I then started to learn about the great hostility that they were facing in our country. And at that point, it just really got to me. I, I, I couldn't believe it on the scale that I learned about it at that time. It really impacted me. Um, because obviously they were my family. They could have been my family. And in parts, they are my family because they are my history. So for me, as a filmmaker, I was really faced with something that I hadn't really quite seen before on the magnitude I'd seen it. And that's what gave me the kind of drive to continue right in the thick of the pandemic, learning about these policies and legislation, learning about the government tactics, learning about divide and rule and empire. It became a journey for me, a, a, one that was deeply connected to my past, but an educational journey also. How incredible uh, and what, what an uh, interesting story. Um, and, and you found some really uh, good people to talk to, uh, to interview as part of uh, the, the documentary. And uh, uh, were they easy to find? I think, Trying to get your debut off the ground in normal circumstances in chat is challenging. Trying to get it off in a global pandemic is also really challenging. So there were some double challenges there to face. Um, for me, it was all about researching local newspapers, the internet, seeking out the stories. So a lot of the work that we did, we did remotely to begin with. I broke my ankle right at the beginning of the production. So I had to really remotely work for the first six weeks. And so a lot of that time, I sort of locked myself down in lockdown in deep, heavy research. So I was trying to find those um, organizations that were responding to the global pandemic uh, in the UK and in London specifically. And that's where I found Daksha. Daksha was in a local newspaper to where I live. And I've, I've learned about her community response kitchen, helping thousands of people and fe feed them during this, this pandemic. And so she was my first entry into my filmmaking, into my narrative. For her, she originally didn't want to be filmed. She was quite protective about what she was doing. And also the people that she was helping didn't really want to be identified. And that's why I didn't cover 
those stories, even though I saw it off camera, I respected their privacy and their integrity. So I just kept that sort of off camera. So she was my first entry really. And when I learned about Daksha and started you know, filming her, that's when I learned about no recourse to public funds and the hostile environment. And it was her narrative that kind of then connected me to the students. And then the students connected me to the wider story of the hostile environment in Farouk. And then Farouk's story really connected me to the seed, the seat of the hostile environment, which took me to the Windrush scandal. And then I started to think, well, this didn't just happen in 2017, 18. That then took me back to the history of hostility in our country. So each participant was found either through the internet, via paper, via the medium of drama. Anthony Bryan's drama came out in June 2020. And when I watched his drama sitting in limbo, that's why I reached out to Anthony. Farouk's story was in The Independent. The student's story was on the news. So I really honed in on various resources to find my participants, but each participant opened my mind to the next, if that makes sense, and the story as it was unfolding. Oh, well done on that. And, and uh, as you Thank say, you. as your debut film, you've, uh, you've done a great job of research and, uh, and filming, which uh, I'll come back to. I wanted to ask you about the Windrush scandal, because I don't know anything about that. And it seems really intriguing. What's it all about? Yeah, so the Windrush was a, a ship that sailed that came here, you know, I believe it was in the late 40s, early 50s. And on that boat were people that came here to better their lives from the Caribbean. They wanted to come here. They wanted to work here. They were offered the opportunity of citizenship to come here. And when they came here, they worked in the NHS mainly those people that came during that time of the Windrush were people that came to facilitate those key worker roles. So they were of that Caribbean heritage. They came to our country, they worked in those roles. You know, the key workers, the painter and decorators, the taxi drivers, the restaurant owners, you know, the factory workers, they all came here at that time. Only to find out five decades later, that their landing cards had been destroyed, that they didn't have any identification, that actually the moment that they started to want to go home with their Jamaican passport, they had to prove their identity to the government because you can't leave on a passport and come back in. So they had to get their British passport in the case of Anthony Bryan. Now, when he tried to get that passport and use his ID, he learned that actually there was no record of him actually being here. So when they arrived here, they got given landing cards. Those were destroyed. All of their paperwork trail then was bills, um, accommodation, rental, uh, bank statements. So they had to gather all this information over years of being here to prove that they lived in this country. So these are people that have been working here for decades, that had parents here, grandparents there, only to be told that actually you don't exist. We don't have any records of you. So then when they have to prove that they have been here, and if they miss a particular part of that paperwork that you know the government or the home office feel that they need to have, they can then be detained and then be de deported, which happened in many cases. And so when this Windrush scandal broke in 2017, 2018, it was Amelia Gentleman, the Guardian journalist, that brought this story to the forefront, that there were thousands of people in this position that came, that believed they came here legally, lawfully, they believed they had the right to stay here, but they were told by the Home Office that they had no identification. So that was then called the scandal. And the scandal was that they were basically being detained and deported for no you know, fault of their own, it's just because of paperwork and legalities. So there are people still fighting today to, to be able to remain in a country that they call their home. Now what's happened subsequently, because of the detaining and the deporting, people have lost their income, people of mental health has been suffered, people have lost their homes, their relationships, their lives, and they haven't been able to work since. So they have now loss of income, and now they're trying to get compensation. And what's happening is that the compensation scheme is being run by the Home Office. So therefore, they have no real motivation 
to compensate these individuals because at one hand they're fighting them and on the other hand they're compensating them so the call now is to actually have this compensation separate from the home office the call now is to have this scandal separate from the home office so that you have an independent review of what's actually happening with the Windrush scandal. And that's why we had a Wendy Williams report about the lessons learned, but we're finding that there's no lessons learned. Every time there is a review, we have knockbacks and individuals are being driven more and more into the ground. And that's what we saw with Anthony Bryan. You know, now his mental health is severely compromised. He hasn't been able to work. During this time, the last five years, he's lost his mum. He's lost his son and he's lost his brother. So not only has he had to deal with loss, he's had to deal with his own crises. And even though he has his British citizenship now, he hasn't got a job. He's lost so much money and he feels like he's lost his identity. You know, wh where am I? Who am I? Where do I sit in this world? Am I British? Am I Jamaican? Even though I now have this passport, you've stripped me of everything that made me feel like I was British. So I still don't feel like I belong. And that is happening to a lot of people that have been given their citizenship because of the brutality of the, the, the thoughts of deportation and being detained and the, the health crisis that goes with that. They just feel like they become identityless, and just they just feel so hollow. And I feel that that's really what's happened to a lot of people. And in the case of Paulette Wilson, who was a Windrush campaigner, who was also was detained at Yarls Wood and, and suffered from a near deportation, had it not been for her daughter, Natalie, she died without receiving compensation. And so people are dying without receiving compensation. And I think that this is a huge scandal. But the problem is now is that we're having many scandals. We're having the scandals related to international students, the scandal now relating to highly skilled migrants, the scandal now related to those people that came here because they met certain criteria and points, only now to be cash cowed. And so I think that these scandals are reoccurring. And you know, this is why this film is so important now because it covers the variety of scandals that are happening in this country. Absolutely extraordinary, and uh, and hence the uh, very pertinent title of hostile. The uh, UK is definitely hostile to so many people. It's uh, absolutely incredible, uh, and I'm so glad you've documented that. Um, and I suppose the latest uh, issue is that uh, refugees and so on are going to be sent off to Rwanda. I know. I mean, if it couldn't get any worse, when I stopped filming hostile, because in the end, ultimately, I had to stop filming. For me, I wanted to chapter everything. I kept on wanting to go on and on. We had the response to Black Lives Matter because of George Floyd. We had the uprising of Black Power, which was incredible. The fighting back against sort of the, the marginalization and targeting of Black people, which was happening during this time of the pandemic. And then we saw things like um, the Nationality and Borders Bill, the police bill, uh, the spy cops bill, you know, the elections bill, all these bills that were coming into place, which were restricting the rights of humans. And then they become acts of parliament in April. And then you think it couldn't get any worse. And then you see what's happening with asylum seekers and refugees. And really this Rwanda scheme is really trying to divide those good migrants against those bad migrants, those good asylum seekers against the bad the good refugees against the bad. So what it's saying is that those people that come by plane are good. You know, they won't get deported to Rwanda, but the ones that come by boat, they're illegal. They're being trafficked. So they, those are the ones that we want to get rid of and send to Rwanda. So about 130 people at that time should have made that plane. And to, with the latter part of the week, when it became really crucial, it got down to like 11 and on the day seven, and then in the end, none of them made that plane journey and now there is a big sort of case against what's happened with Rwanda and the government are fighting back to try and overturn it because this is really you know impacting human rights and breaking human rights law so I think you know my concern was when filming Hostile is that this is as bad as it's going to get and I captured the police bill in my film and then that was pending and then it became an act of law and then you think this is getting worse and so I feel like there is 
things are getting worse, but at the same time, by highlighting these issues, by having films like Hostile, by going to Parliament, which I did two weeks ago, by meeting Rishi Sunak, which I did at 11 Downing Street, by the uprising that's happening at grassroots, by the narrative that's out there. And there is a change in mood with more empathy towards migrants in our country. We have seen that with what happened at the last part of the film, where in Glasgow, thousands of people came out to stop that deportation from happening. And that is what hap that is happening now. And these are not just people from black and brown and migrant communities. These are people from white communities. So there is an uprising happening right now. And there's more awareness, which is something I'm really happy about in light of all of the awfulness that's happening around us. I do see some hope, definitely. That's good to hear. And the power of filmmaking can be quite extraordinary in this case. And, and I must add, uh, Australia is not too much different to uh, mm -hmm. uh, the way we're, that we treat <laughs> refugees and asylum seekers to the UK. So, uh, yeah, yeah. In incredible. Yeah, yeah you know. have a points-based system also, don't you? Yes. I think yes. we actually learnt about the points-based system because of you guys. So I think there are some similarities. What I'm hoping now with Australia, with having now a Labour government, that there will be more leniency against migrant communities and we might see a change in behaviour, change in music, change in policy, which is something that we're really hopeful for here. Of course, uh, yeah, let's hope for that. So, Sunita, incredible, you've, you've uh, made this film. Uh, tell me about getting the archival footage uh, and other production values behind you, including incredible Enoch Powell and so on, who were so uh, rabidly anti-Black, uh, etc. cetera. Um, tell me about getting production behind you, financing, to be able to make this film. Yeah, it was a struggle. I mean, I think when you're a debut director with no track history, trying to make a film is impossible. You know, there are very little funds out there for debuts in our country and broadcasters won't really look because you've not got a track record. So I didn't, I wasn't able to raise the money um, for the film. And uh, then I went out to financier, so to networks upon networks. So I branched out to family, to friends, and then beyond that, just kept asking people to ask everybody. So in the end, three of us financed Hostile. You know, there were another two financiers that put the majority of the money in, which I'm so grateful for. During the pandemic also, there wasn't really much work. So my crew were really grateful to work on the film and they maintained to be my same crew throughout the whole of the production. So we were able to get, in a sense, better deals in a way, and people were so grateful to be working. So I think, you know, Hostile was made for probably less than it could have been made. And the archive houses were so kind to me because they really believed in the subject matter. I was able to strike deals when I was kind of packaging up a number of minutes from a particular archive house. So I think in terms of financing, it was problematic, it was tricky. But whilst I was raising finance, I got into places like CPH Docs. You know, I went to IDFA with the film, you know, um, Hot Docs had it on their platform. You know, it's like all these different festivals kind of supported my journey. And I think, and we also got into a number of festivals. So that really kind of put the film in people's kind of minds and also put it on their radar. So in the ultimately in the end, once the film was finished and out there, if I was looking for broadcasts, I could connect with those people again, which I have done and subsequently got broadcast deals off the back of those initial connections. So I think even though it was problematic to raise the money, all of those sort of network building during those early days of filming and then during post and then delivery and now out in the world of kind of being in cinemas and festivals has been really great for the film. And in terms of the archive, for me, filming during the pandemic is also really tricky. The actuality part of the film was nigh on impossible. You know, when I was in people's houses, we were all following kind of COVID protocols. And that was really important for me that no one got sick on the production. No one got COVID. We didn't pass COVID on. So when you're adhering to those, those protocols, you can't spend days and weeks with an individual. You know, ultimately somebody's going to get sick. So that's why a lot of the seated interviews happened and less actuality. And because I wanted to 
make this story not just about the present day narrative but connect it to the historical past i wanted to bring in those themes of empire partition enoch powell and then look at the tracks of traces of migration from the 50s the 60s the 70s the 80s the 90s the 2000s to present day you know to looking at acts of parliament and then looking at leaders you know like um uh, David Cameron and Tony Blair and how they were complicit in formulating this hostile environment. So for me, it was like that hostility didn't just come about by the current arrangement by Boris Johnson and Priti Patel, uh, by then Theresa May that coined the hostile environment in 2012. This hostility came about decades ago. Mm -hmm. And actually, if I'd had talk more time, I would have gone back to Labour post-war Clement Attlee, which kind of put in hostile environment policies back then, and that was Labour. So for me, it was like tracing that hostility through the decades. And the only way I could do that by was use, using archive. And so it, it, it was, for me, it was like a film of like actuality, archive, talking heads, and weaving in and out that narrative with music from Knitting Sorne, spoken words by George the Poet, it felt like an immersive film for me of, of all different means of like a filmmaking processes, which is why I loved making Hostile, really. Well, congratulations on that. You've woven it all together extremely well. And it's a, uh, it's a very effective uh, documentary. It's an angry film in many respects, but it needs to be to, to make that point. So well done yeah. on that. I must ask you about the editing because with then all of this material that you've shot and the archive, everything else, the editing is always the most difficult part of any documentary. Uh, what were the challenges you faced in uh, putting together the final cut? Yeah, there was a lot of challenges. What I initially did was I, I um, transcribed all my interviews. So I went through every seated interview and then I transcribed them and I read through each interview and then I, I created an assembly of three hours of the film, the entire film from my interviewees. So they told the story. I then then layered that with my own voice. I then weaved my own voice into that process. And at that point, I brought on my editor. So my editor was Alex Fry, great editor, by the way, worked with him very closely for 28 weeks. We then went through the footage and what I'd done during the process of my filmmaking was that I assembled key scenes and I went through and I kind of like went through the timeline, you know, picked out footage and, and, and narrative that I thought would work for my story. So we went through all of that footage in the initial few weeks of the filmmaking, uh, at the editing. So we weaved in the story into different sequences and different acts, act one, act two, act three. So in the end, we had like a three hour, three and a half hour film. And it was at that point that we were trying to get our film down to 90 minutes. And I think, as I said, this film could have gone on for like a six to eight part series. So trying to capture all of these themes into a 90 minute was very, very challenging. And as I was editing, I was also researching. I was learning about these policies, learning about the hostile environment, learning about empire, learning about Brexit. And it was kind of having to research, edit, learn, and construct at the same time was hugely challenging for a first time director. And, and so I worked really closely with Alex to get that down. But then every night after the edit, I would watch a cut of the film. <laughs> and then I would give my notes the next day. So I was watching a cut getting home and I've got a nice big TV at home. So put it on the big TV. And then when you see it on a big screen, you know, like you kind of see all of the imperfections, you hear all the imperfections. So I immersed myself as a kind of viewer every night into my own film, cutting out scenes, replacing scenes, cutting out narrative, adding narrative. And that journey continued really. And then it was at that point I got on my exec producer, Charlotte, who had a lot of experience in TV. And she helped me really bring out the story of the characters, really bring out their story. So I, I, I guess my editor and my exec producer were really crucial in that time of my editing and also my associate producer, Raga. It became a real team effort. Um, but in the end, I kind of had final say on what made the cut. And I made some really 
important, challenging decisions. And I'm glad I stuck by those. So yeah, it was, it was great. It was a great process. I loved it actually very much. Well done on that. That is that is quite a process. So I admire. I speak to so many filmmakers, and uh, the the editing process is always the most challenging in terms of uh, deciding what stays in and what goes out, and so on. So I, I'm I'm intrigued, Sunita, um, as this is your first film, etc. Are there any influences in terms of the style uh, or the approach you took to hostile? Any documentary films or filmmakers or anyone else who perhaps may have yeah. influenced you? Yeah, I guess when I watched Eugene Jarecki's film, The House I Live In, when he wove in, he, he used sort of archive actuality into his storytelling, there was a lot more actuality and less talking heads than my film. But that whole process of what he did and how he achieved that, his film was about the war on drugs. My film was about the war on the hostile environment. And I think that that, that film was something that, really inspired me in terms of how I was going to connect all the different facets of filmmaking into the storytelling. And so I think he was probably one of my greatest influences for sure. Okay, very interesting. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and now with your debut film, are you now planning more films? Yeah, I mean, I'm kind of committed to Hostile for a, a long time now. I've got I don't know whether you know, but it's been in cinema since January 2022. It had its rain dance premiere in October 2021. We've been in a number of festivals. I'm so grateful to be in the festival in Melbourne, um, Documentary Film Festival. I'm just so excited to be in Australia. And so we're on this festival tour. And at the same time, we're in the cinemas in the UK. We've now got broadcast in, in Norway. We've now uh, secured some broadcast here. So we're just on this trajectory of kind of getting the film still out there. I'm also heavily involved in a legal impact campaign and also an educational impact campaign. So we're creating a toolkit for hostile to be in law firms and a toolkit for hostile to be in schools, colleges and universities. So I'm kind of in that uh, mix of getting it out there, but there are people that are driving that with me and it, I'm empowering students to run the educational aspect and lawyers to run the legal so I'm kind of tied up with that until probably December uh, and then next year I'm going to start putting my thoughts together for my next film I want to stay making documentary films about the very communities I grew up in because it's what I know I feel like when I'm deeply connected to subject matter something happens in me, it's a feeling, it's an emotional, it's visceral, and it's just my calling. I know that might sound a bit crappy, but it just, it, I have to make films that come from my DNA. So India and empire and my parents' story was my upbringing, their struggle was my struggle. And that intergenerational trauma has continued throughout my whole life. And I've never really faced it, being a daughter of a refugee. And I feel like in my filmmaking, I need to face those fears almost um, and, and tell those stories. So I'm hoping that my next film will be around that subject matter of that crisis that we're in consistently, whether it's the crisis in Afghanistan, in Syria, in Yemen, in Iran, in Iraq, you know, we have crises happening in Ukraine right now. We have crises all over the world. And they are crises that have been happening for hundreds of years. And it's like, we're not learning from the mistakes that we've made in the past. So for me, I'm gonna go back to India and I'm gonna go back to that crisis that happened to my parents. And I'm gonna try and unfold and tell that story in a way that's so kind of approachable and kind of appealing, but accessible to audiences that they can deeply connect to from their own heritage. We were all migrants. We were all working class, no matter what wealth you have, what class you believe that you're in, what socioeconomic group, we were all poor in our ancestors' DNA. And I think that for me is something that I want to focus on too. <laughs> yeah. Fair enough, sounds great. Just as a quick aside, have you seen Gurinda Chada's film about the partitioning of India and yes. Pakistan? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Viceroy, Viceroy House. I Viceroy House, yes. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I, I love that film. And I think that was a, a narrative 
a scripted storytelling of that event. And I feel that there is a, an opportunity to really go further with documentary filmmaking. In my film will be about the history of India, really. So I've now reached out to key houses, archive houses, to try and find that material, really. And again, it will be working with musicians, artists, archive, spoken word, and maybe some dance. I've, I'm really kind of drawn to the kind of movement as well in terms of storytelling. So again, it, it, it's a multi-discipline, multi-central exploration of my storytelling through different mediums. That, that's what I'm hoping to achieve. But again, it's a project, a big undertaking. It will probably take me a long time, um, but I'm hoping this time I will get a producer and I'll get some money. <laughs> Let's well, hope. Who knows? Let's, let's hope. Well, I wish you well on that because I think uh, I'm sure you're going to make something really interesting. So uh, uh, congratulations on, on that. And certainly congratulations on Hostile. Um, and we've been speaking to Sunita Gale, who's the director of Hostile Screening as part of the Melbourne Documentary Film Festival. Uh, and thank you so much, Sunita, for talking with me. Oh, thank you so much. Anytime. Appreciate you taking the time today. Pleasure. All the best. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.